Mel, my name is Lawrence. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. You know why you're here? Uh, yes. You know why you're here. Yes. You'd have your head done, portrait for a sculpture in, to be, to be set up in or placed in Doncaster somewhere, mining. And you're here really to talk about your Please. life please, while we do your head. My life in mining. Your life in mining, your life right. after mining and before mining and everything, Right, before really. mining. Yeah, right. family, family but and... I was brought up in a mining village. Really, where's that? Stainford. Ah, so you and were at Hatfield? Yes, I was at Hatfield Colliery. I was at Rosington for three years before that, right. from 1970 to 73. And then uh, I couldn't get a job at Hatfield at that time and the, the pit was over the field from where I lived. Oh no. But I couldn't get a job there, so I went to Rosington. I worked for three years there on haulage. Then I came back to Hatfield when they accepted me, when there was a vacancy. Yeah. I went on the haulage there, and it was a totally different pit to Rosington. It was smelly and horrible oh, really? and wet. So they, quite, they, they changed in personality quite a lot, these. Oh, yeah. Every pit's got its own personality. So Rosington was what? Dry and...? Dry, hot, because we're in the Barnsley scene. Right. And the Barnsley bed was really, really hot because they cut the ventilation down to stop the spontaneous combustion. Yes, we're talking about this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they cut the ventilation down so it's always hot. So yeah. I came from a hot pit into Hatfield, which was a cool pit. Right. And uh, if you worked in the headings, you know, these are dry beaches, it was always hot in there because you relied on fans ventilating. Right. But on the coal faces, it wasn't too bad. Because in the hazel where I worked, it was about 36 to 60 inches. So the hazel is a seam? Seam of coal, yeah. Right, they call it the hazel. We were told it was the best coal in the country. I think every mine has had the best coal in yeah, the country. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it was Queen's, no, it wasn't Queen's coal, was it? That's Bentley. No, it was Hatfield. Hatfield was Queen's yeah, coal. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, every miner will tell you that, that the Queen's Coal came from their yes. pit. <laughs> but I know officially, you know officially that it came from Hatfield. Right. High Hazel Coal was the best quality. Wasn't it? Yes. Very sought after. That's why Hatfield Pit was still open when all the rest were closed. Oh. Because of the quality of the coal. And is that because of the stone it's found in? The sea, how does it, is it its depth for? I don't know really. I have no idea. All I know is that it was very, very good coal. But they had to, it was so good, it burnt so hot that they had to combine it with Barnsley bed coal. Right. So that it burned at a certain rate. Right. So they had to mix it up. For the coal, for the power stations, yeah. Gosh. So anyway, so you got your job in, Hat you went to Hatfield after Rosington, but in Hatfield yeah, was Yeah, that was smelly. in 1973. Christ. And uh, I worked on the coal face from 1975 till 1980, and then I went on staff. All right. Then Prior to that, I did a degree in, in, in politics and economics at Sheffield University. Bloody hell. But that was paid for by the union, by the NUN. So this was, you were, so you were a minor? Yes. And they, they paid you to be re-educated? Yes. Because you were leaving? Indoctrinated, you... can I just say, it was indoctrination. Gosh. I didn't realise at the time, but I do now. Into, what we, are we saying, into well, the left-wing left yeah, politics? Yeah. It, they wanted me to be a Corbynista, because that's what Corbyn is, you know, he's a left-winger. And we were left-wingers then, and it was great then. Yeah. We needed left-wingers then, but we don't need them now. Right. We don't need them now. And I've voted Labour all my life, yeah. and I've got no one to vote for now. Gosh. And I'm really, really fed up about that. Yeah. You know. Yeah. But what can you do? Wait. Wait, exactly. <laughs> and I think there'll be momentous, big changes. Momentous within. changes. There must, must be around the yeah, corner soon. There will be. Definitely. God. Definitely. Blimey. So then in 1980, I had to make a decision whether to go um, into politics, right. which most of my friends did that went on the course at Sheffield, or on the staff. What do you mean by on the staff? Well, to become an official of the mine. Right. So and white, um, collar, white collar. Well, no, we were on the job. Right. On the job. But, uh, yeah, colliery deputy. A deputy, right, gotcha. Which, uh, which I actually... Keep forward when I go around your side. So I did accept that. I, um, I went on staff okay. and I, t I remember telling my mates, I said to them, I said, look, I said, I know most of you are going into politics. Some went on to become MPs, some became really? leaders of councils. One of my friends became leader of Doncaster Council. Good Lord. Yeah, and I could have followed that, but I didn't. I went on to become a colliery um, official. So is this because you loved mining, had a passion for Yeah, it? I did, yeah, I did. And I still have, right. if, if I had my time again. 
I bet they all say that. Well, yeah, the ones that come here. <laughs> I bet the ones that don't come that. here never want to go back in it again. No, exactly. I, I talk to friends now and they don't want to know, you know. Yeah. I said to a guy the other day, I said, can you remember when we worked on 70s, Brian? He said, 70s? Where was that then? I said, you worked on there for four years. He said, no. He said, all I did was get off the chair, get on the paddy and go where I was told. That was it. But I loved mining, yeah, loved it. And I'd still do it again now. I would. And you love mining because? I don't know, I think a lot of people say it's the camaraderie. Yeah, yeah to a certain extent, yeah, there was that. But it was the job itself. It was a challenge every single day. It was a, what I call a proper job. Yeah. You didn't know what to expect from one day to the next. Like I say, it changed. The seam could behave itself one day, the next day it was in. Really? And uh, you could guarantee that you, you went into the control room, you'd phone your colleague on the face on day shift, let's say it was an afternoon shift, pick the phone up, you get to know what was happening, and you could guarantee it at field because the sieve there was very friable, that the roof had come in at a certain point during, you know, along the face. So the first thing I used to do is direct men towards the fall, get them to shore it all up, Timber it up, as we used to call it, mm. and then continue cutting coal. But yeah, for how long was that? I, um, You're talking about after a, a ceiling fall, a, a, a roof fall, yeah. Roof fall. yeah. I mean, how common was that? Oh, very common at Hatfield, yeah. Really? Yeah, all the time. Are you talking about stuff in the gob? No, no, you know, no. You talk about it on the face side. Really? Yeah. Yeah, it was. It was common at Hatfield. It was terrible. The roof conditions at Hatfield were absolutely awful. Is that because the coal was high quality? No, this is the stone falling down, isn't it? It's, it's the, the stone coal. above, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think, no, it was with the equipment we were using, I think. What, what do you mean, sending shot waves up through the... No, uh, what happens is that if you don't support the roof initially, straight away, you know, you, you cut the coal out and then you support it straight away. Yeah. If you don't support it straight away, or if you support it and the roof isn't supported properly, yeah. then it'll come in. And so and you're if, saying your props and chocks weren't the right design for the job? Yeah, they were an old shock. I remember going on to 71s. Oh, what a face that was. The very first face I ever worked on. So what is numbers? What's the 70? They're just name, uh, numbers regarding the units that you worked on. I worked in the northeast of the pit, which was five miles from the pit bottom. Jesus. And it was very hot. In five there, miles? In yeah, five, five miles. Five miles? And we used to go down a one in 16 drift to get there. And, and, the and, diesel. That one, and that one to get back. Twelve coaches on it, with like 20 men in each coach. Good God. And it used to get away a few times. Really? Yeah. Really? Yeah. And then there was an incident at Bentley Pit, and a friend of mine was killed there on that incident. Which what incident was that? It was when the paddy got away. On, a, on an incline, a one in 16 like we had at Hatfield. And uh, the driver didn't get the diesel in control, and it... It just came off the road and crashed and killed a dozen men. A dozen men? <coughs> yeah. Yeah. And an old mate of mine that was in the mines rescue with me called Don Box, he was killed there. Jesus. At that time, I thought to myself, right, I'm 42. What am I going to do with the rest of my life? And I was in Doncaster, walking around one day, it was a lovely sunny day in May. And I thought, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And then I thought, right, I'm going to go to the college and find out what's available. Right. So I went to Doncaster College, the old one on Watergate, Waterdale. Mm. And for some reason, they were on holiday. It must have been half term or something like that. And I walked in and there was one woman in there. She was on the top floor. So I went up, had a chat with her. He said, what do you want to do? I said, well, I said, I've always liked art all my life. Really? I said, and I've always liked horticulture, growing things. So she says, well, can you make your way to High Melton? I said, yeah. So I, I went off to High Melton, had a look at the course there on horticulture. It was all right, but it didn't really, you know. Challenge you. Challenge, yeah. So I went back to the college and she said, hold on a minute, I've got a guy out at Doncaster College, the old college just up the road, mm -hmm. called Steve Hall. He's the head of fire. He's going to wait for you at the door. Go and have a chat. So 
So I did. Yeah. I drove over and uh, parked the car up at the front. No, I parked it in the car park. Yeah, that's right. I've just walked past it actually. Brought a lot of memories back. And I, I went into Steve's office, a little tiny thing, a little tiny cubby hole somewhere, and he got a cigarette out. And he said, Mel, do you want a fag? And I went, yeah, go on then. Because I used to smoke then. So I had a fag and a cup of tea, and we had a chat for about four hours. Four, four hours. hours, literally. God, he's a dedicated... He's, a, he's an art man, not a pit man. <laughs> we had a chat about life look at me a bit in on. general. Right. And, uh, and I said, right, then when's my interview? He said, you just had it. He said, that in September. Really? And how do you ready... So, so was this fine art or...? Fine art. So you no portfolio? I no, didn't have nothing. You had nothing to show for it, so he took you on just because of you the face was fitting. Yeah, and from what he'd uh, gleaned from yeah. my, you know, talking to him. Wow. And then I got a letter telling me to do some work. And I went, what? I've not done any artwork since I was at school. Wow. Since I was 15, 16. So they gave me a brief, and so I did what I could. Took it in on the day I started, which we all did. First time you met all your student friends. Yeah, I remember that day as well, really. It, to this Friday. day, I remember it. No, it was Friday day of your life. No, no, <laughs> it was so easy. It was so, I don't know, it, was, it just came naturally. Really? Yeah. And we put all the work out on the floor and everybody walked around and looked at it and it was awful. Yours was or everyone's was? Everyone's. Right. Awful. We pinned it up in our workspace. And it was there all the way through the 12 months. Really? Yeah. To show you? Just to see how far you'd come. It's quite interesting idea, isn't it? And, uh, yeah, it soon went in the bin. Yeah. Yeah. And then I went on to university. So what was that course? That course would have been a, a B-Tech or something? Yeah, or? yeah. Well, no, the B-Techs weren't out then. Or whatever they were. It was something else. I've got the diploma. Certificate. Diploma. Yeah, it was some kind of diploma, yeah. I got a, what did I get in that? I got a, what grade? I got a top grade. I got it out the other day. I looked at it. And I, I, I acquired a top grade in, in art and design. Wow. And then I applied for university. And, and but I met so many interesting people at Doncaster mm. College. All tutors, by the way. Oh, right. As well as students, but yeah. mainly tutors. Yeah. And I kept in touch with them right up until the new college of this place opened. Mm. Yeah. And I've just learned that an old friend of mine's retired. He was in charge of printmaking. All right. He just retired. But he was a big influence on me because yeah. I love printmaking. So, so you went. Where did you go and do your degree? Norwich. Really. School of Art and Design. That's my St. territory. George's. Yes. So, what dates were you there? Ninety-six oh to two thousand and two. But I did. I graduated in 99. And what course did you do? They called it Visual Studies. Oh, oh, yeah. Visual Studies. And I'm trying to think of the guys that taught me, well, tutored me. I'm trying to think of his first name. Martin. Martin. His proper name was Martini. He well, was he's from Italian descent. It wasn't Martin Welsh. No. There was a sculpture. In no. A sculpture. No. And Chris Summerfield were there then. Chris was yeah. my course leader. No. Yeah. Well, he's one of my greatest friends. Is he? Yeah. He was my, he was my course leader. Was yeah. he really? What a wonderful guy. Yeah. So Chris was up. For a while. Yeah, and yeah. then he moved on. Was it sculpture? Yep. Yeah, he went yeah. into sculpture and we got someone else. Chris, he was, he was from photography. Chris, oh, for, do you know? I forgot. Names go. Names go. Faces never do. I always remember faces. Yeah. I've just been sat in reception, students coming in, and I remember most of them. Really? Yeah, from when I was at Danham. Yeah. So you did your art, you did your visual studies course. Yeah. So you're going on a hell of a career life journey here. I know. Did you ever have an idea of what you wanted to be or do? No. So I, did it, for, I did it for fun. And so you were funding this because of your mining pension, was it, or something? Or? No, I um, I had to beg, borrow, and yeah. Wow, so it's a to big get sacrifice. Well, I'd, I'd just been div recently divorced. Good God, that was a whole new life. So I'd lost the house, 
had everything really. I had two pounds fifty in my pocket when I came out of court. My That's wife cool. got everything. She got me redundancy pay, which amounted to about fifty grand. Mm. <clears throat> she got the house. I had two pounds fifty in a car. Good God. And I came out of court that day and I thought, two pounds fifty, what do I do? Do I get a pint? Or do I put some petrol in the car? It was obvious, really, I'd put petrol in the car. Good God. How did you feel? Were you angry or were you like, like were just... Angry, yeah, for quite a while. Yeah. A couple of years, maybe. But I didn't cause any trouble. No. You know, I let them get on with their life, my ex-wife and my kids. And I just went on to do other things. Were you... Did you, have, did you see your kids? Oh, yes, all the time. Every every half term, every you know, every chance. Yeah. Yeah. Always did. Yeah. So you weren't estranged all. No. No. And I'm proud of that fact. Yeah. And my kids now, I, I see them all the time. They live in um, Otley. Oh really? They live in Otley, and I go every weekend. Otley, uh, as in up near up Yorkshire, in? North Yorkshire. Yeah. There's an Otley in Suffolk as well. Oh, is there? Yeah. Otley oh. College, Agricultural College. Right. Is that called Otley? Yeah. Right. I spent a lot of time in printmaking up there as well. There was a guy up there with a beard. A bit of a hippie. I don't know his name. Can't remember his name now. He helped me a lot. Because that's what you did in uni. You went to different departments yeah. and... If you, used it, if you used it well. And I did. I used I it. Like I, it. I did use it well, yeah. And that's how you learn, you know? It's a big learning curve, university. It's about... It's about sourcing knowledge and material, isn't it? Yeah. You know. So you weren't disappointed? Oh, no. No. And how did you... Loved it. Culturally, I mean, it's a bad, weird question. Yeah. But compare it to mining and the... Oh, government. million miles away. Did you, did you find similarities? Okay, what did you find similarities? No. No. <laughs> Absolutely none. No camaraderie. It was a million miles away from coal mining, yeah. million miles away. I remember coming back after being away for only six months and I stood at the, on the top of the railway bridge looking at the pit and I went, my God, did I actually work there? Really? Yeah. They used to, I used to have a saying, I used to say, I went from the coal face to the chalk face yeah. when I became a teacher. Oh, so you became a teacher? Yeah. Okay. I did a PGCE at uh, Lancaster when I left Norwich. I left Norwich 2002. Lots of friends down there still, still go back. Really? Yeah. Still go back. Fantastic place. It's a beautiful place, isn't it? It is. It is. And because I lived there, you know, I used to explore every weekend. I used to go out onto all the beach. I've done every beach, I think, from Low Stuff to, to um, where? Um, Probably Wells. Wells, yeah. Wells. That's, that's the furthest north I ever went, I think. When I was in Were you North. driving? No, I'd sold the car. I had to sell everything to, to fund my um, course, you know, degree. She had to find a girlfriend with a car. She did. She had a car. She took me everywhere. Absolutely everywhere. I hope this is not going out onto the national thing. <laughs> no, no, not yet. Oh, thank God. Well, I'll not mention any names anyway. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. so we ended up doing, so you decided that teaching was the way forward. You keep looking forward when I'm talking. Well, I, at first, I wanted to do an MA. I applied for an MA in London right. at the Slade. Yeah. And I got a place. Gosh. And, well done, you. Yeah. And I talked it over with my partner. She wanted to do a PGCE in Cambridge at the time. She wanted to teach. So she was, during her spare time, she was doing like little bits of teaching at different schools, near law stuff. And like I say, I wanted to do an MA. And we had a big bust up, big fallout. Everything went pear shape in my final year. Oh no. Yeah, bad time. January, it wasn't my final year. So I don't know what she did. I don't know whether she went and did a PGC or not. But prior to that, I agreed with her that I wouldn't do my MA, that I would 
sell down in Bakefield. Really? Yeah. That we'd live together, etc., etc. So I gave up the place, and it's like, oh. I know, it's what you do for love. And uh, I don't know what happened then. She went on to do what she did. I had no idea what she did. So you made that decision and then you had your boss stop? Yeah. Yeah. That was a bit unfortunate. I know. Tell me about it. Big style. And it's lived with me ever since. So you couldn't reapply the next year, as it were? No. You only got the one chance at the slave. You know what the slave was like, you know. Yeah, so I lived in Norwich for a while. I went to work at a few places. I worked at Bertram's Books. Remember Bertram's? Yeah. Went to work there for a while. Worked at Halford's. And then the time came for me to move on because I wanted to teach by then. I thought, right, I'm going to teach. That's all that's left at my age. You know, I was in my mid-40s. I thought, I've got to do something. So I, I went to teach. I went to Lancaster, did my PGCE. And it was the worst course I've ever been on in my life. Oh, Horrible course. Didn't enjoy it one bit. It was totally unlike university. Totally unlike university. And I taught at two schools in Lancashire, Plategate High in Blackburn, and the Royal Grammar School for Boys in Lancaster. That was a good school. Really? Yeah. That How was that your politics? Oh, it surprised, it, it was surprising. They had a history society, and what did they do? They asked me to talk about the miners' strike because it was the anniversary. And uh, so I did. I stood in the main hall and talked to like, I don't know, probably 200 kids and really? staff. Yeah. Oh, they took to questions. That was the main thing, you know. And there was one lad there, I always remember him, year eight. He said, Sir, my dad was in the minor strikes. Oh, yeah, which pit did he work at? He said he didn't. He was a copper. Oh, God. <laughs> and he was. Manchester policeman. Yeah. So what did you teach? Art. Oh, really wonderful. And maths. Really? What a combination. Wow. What a combination. Art and maths. I used to love maths. I, I think I like maths as much as art. Really? Mm. Yeah, I used to love it. But, uh, and then I retired two years ago. Oh, right. So how long were you teaching? From... 2004, 2004, till 2017, yeah. So, all, and at this private school? No, no, I, uh, I left Lancashire and came back to Doncaster. I met lots of people there as well. What a lovely place, Lancaster. Mm. Marvellous place. We've got loads of pubs as well. Because I used to drink real ale, and uh, I don't drink now at all. I don't drink, don't smoke, you know, don't do much at all. There's a reason for that, just to keep yourself healthy. Yeah, mainly. I just went off it, just stopped drinking. Just totally fell out with beer, totally. Just picked a pint up one day and went, I don't want that. You know. And yet I loved beer. Yeah. Loved it. Beer and pit work and, and art went hand in hand, yeah. you know. Yeah. So where did you teach in Doncaster? So I came back to Doncaster and applied for a teaching job at Doncaster, couldn't get one. Tried everywhere. So I thought, do I really want to teach? And I thought, no, I don't. But I want to work in education. I did a lot of um, work with my brother, because my brother works for the local authority. He is a... He's a um, a countryside ranger for the local authority and he, um, he got me a few jobs in schools doing clubs oh, right. with tiny kids and it was brilliant, I loved it we were making sculpture yeah. I'd split them all up into little groups and you make the head and you make the hands and you make the legs and you make this and, you... and then we put it all together really? and make this massive you know, we made birds, we made kestrels Wow. that were like 
20 foot wing spanner, and all that kind of thing. Uh, withies, just withies and you know, weaving and that kind of stuff. Yeah, I did a bit, a bit of that. And then um, I, one day, my brother, another brother of mine, I've got five brothers, all right, came in and he said, There's a job going at Danham. I said, Yeah, what is it? It's not teaching, is it? He went, No. As um, a TA. So I went as a TA. And I worked as a, as, a, as a TA for 10 years. And you like that, but you prefer that to teaching? Yeah. No responsibility or? Yeah, that was the main thing. Yeah. So what are you doing now? I'm retired and I do absolutely nothing when it comes to work, because I don't need to. Mm. I've got several pensions. I've been collecting my pit pension since I was 50. Really? So I've had about 200 grand out of them now. Good God. But I paid a lot into it at the time. Yeah. It was a superannuated pension. Best thing I ever did. Yeah. And yeah, I don't know really. I don't know what I want to do now. I've not made my mind up. Are you making art? No, but I'm starting. I've made a conscious decision to start again. Yeah. But did you I'm, ever make it independently of an institution? Mm, did you ever work outside a structure, as it were? No. Personal motivation or what? No. No. Maybe I should have. Well, that's what artists do, sadly. Yeah, I know they do. <laughs> and they don't make a lot of money, do they? No, they don't. And that, that was the reason why I didn't, you know, I, <clears throat> I, had, to, I had to work. Yeah. And when you work, especially in teaching, you don't get time. So. Got you. But now I've got all the time in the world. Yeah. And it's difficult to motivate yourself, is it, or not? No. But, not. but I'm, a, I'm in conflict. All right. Two things. Mm. One, the side of me that wants to do the art that I left off doing, mm. which was fine art, <coughs> and then this painting yeah. in watercolour, the horticultural side's coming out of me oh, again. Oh, wow. Flowers. I love yeah. flowers. I love them. So I'm, I'm painting flowers at the moment. Lovely. Yeah, believe it or not. Oh, brilliant. Yeah. I started off quite simply just by painting a flower and then it's moved on and I don't know what it'll, where it'll take me, I've got no idea. Beautiful. I mean, I did that, I started painting birds' nests. Yeah. Just for no reason. Yeah. Other than I could collect them. And They're beautiful objects, just aren't they? Try and, really, try not to be an artist, but just to be an observer. Study. Mm. Just look, look, look. Draw to study. Yeah. And forget the art business, just enjoy yeah. the relationship. And I, re yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. And I can't wait to get back to that. <laughs> yeah. So you, are you, you're doing watercolours in watercolour? Right? At the moment. I've got some gouache as well. I like gouache. Mm. It's lovely quality. Um, oils, acrylics, I love all of them. This is, this is the course coming out again, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. You know, try everything. And, and I just can't stick to one thing. Yeah. I can't. I'll start on flowers and I'll probably move to something else. But I like hands-on, I like to make, yeah. you know. So do you have a studio, what sort of house you got? You got a studio type thing? Or no, I've got a little pokey house, you know, there's no space whatsoever. The kitchen is the best room in the house. Yeah. And uh, because it's bright, it's bright, south facing. And uh, so, so do you live by there. yourself? Yeah, yeah. I've been single since, 1999. Good Lord. I know. That's what I say. <laughs> so Several you're, times a day. You got used to it now. Yeah. Did it take getting used to? Yeah, it did at first. Yeah, it was a bind at first. Yeah. Because I'd always been in relationships since, you know. But no, since then I've not bothered. Mm. Well, I have. I've but dabbled. Not with. I've dabbled. Yeah. But no, no, not cohabitated now. No. I think you become independent after a while. You know, you don't want anyone else to meddle in your life. Yeah. You know, after you've gone through several instances of breakup, yeah. uh, you think, no, you, I don't want that again. So you don't do it. It's tempting. It was tempting, but no. 
you tend to walk away. So how does it, what's it like being in a culture, in a place where you were obviously complete control of it, not control, but you were in, as I said, had a position of, position of power, I suppose, mm -hmm. yeah. and then, and, and, a, and a culture that was completely understood itself and a camaraderie like that, really intense. To go to a place like that, and then the, the questions they ask you are so trite, so <laughs> naff, so kind of stereotypical. Yeah. And it must be quite a difficult... They were, the questions were, but I enjoyed explaining. Or trying to so paint did you explain a picture. Rear, rear, you know, you know, Front of buttons types of, and bit, bit of, yeah, types of mining. Gobs and yeah, things like and all that. that. Difficult to explain that to anyone. Mm. Unless you've actually seen it, you wouldn't have a clue what I was talking yeah. about. You wouldn't have a clue. I mean, most of the time, I imagine, they think you were in a tunnel, mm. at the end of the tunnel, yeah. and they even thought how the coal would come out, mm. let alone this kind of advancing face mm. and all these kind of wheels and all that sort of stuff. And the, gob the, face, and the, the faces I had were worth four million quid. Well, that's interesting. So what, what, when you say we're worth, what, the one line? Yeah, the, the equipment. The equipment. The equipment was four million quid worth, and I was in charge of that. That was my um, responsibility. Wow. Everything that went on on that coal face was my responsibility. The machinery, the coal cutting, and the men. The safety aspect, everything. Mm. Everything was my sole responsibility. That's incredible. Even the manager couldn't come on my unit without my permission. Yeah. He wasn't allowed on until I said yes, you can come on. And the HMI, you know the uh, inspector of mines, of quarries. He couldn't come on my unit without phoning me and saying uh, this is so and so so and so. I'm at your meeting station now um, and I'd say yeah I'll come out and meet you. Yeah, it was mine. No one else's. Yeah, so it was that. mine for eight hours. It's incredible. No one else is just mine. And did you enjoy that responsibility? I did. It didn't go to my head though. No. You know, I didn't like it. Did some. Some deputies were. Yeah. Enjoyed being deputies. Yes. The best thing that happened in the pits was when the uh, miners went on strike for a year. Because. Because we were given the management were given back the right to manage. Because before that, the union managed. Okay. They picked the teams, they picked the men. Yeah. But once the strike was over, 1985, when I went back down the pit, the manager pulled us in and he said, right, for the first time in the history of British coal, we can manage the pit. And he gave me a list of men and he says, pick your teams out of that. And I looked and I picked my team. First time ever it really? did happen. Yeah, yeah. The teams were always picked by the union. Really? Yeah. The pits were run by the unions. That's why, you know, it was a good thing that I got paid all the way through the strike. Did you? Yeah. Because? I worked one day out of 12 months and got paid a full year's salary. Because I was on staff. I wasn't on strike. Bloody hell. How did that go down with you in the, in the world of... In the social life? No, nobody really bothered. When I went back to the pubs, you know, at the weekends, there, there were still miners in there that had been on strike for six, seven months. They were still um, drinking. Right. So I made you wonder where the money came from, you know. So did you pick it at all then? You stayed out of it? No, because we weren't on strike. NACODs weren't on strike, you see, the deputies union. Mm. We did vote to go on strike, but Thatcher intervened. She called a meeting uh, between the union officials and herself and um, offered a pay rise. Really? Yeah, 25% pay rise. To stay in work? To stay uh, yeah, out of it, so we did. We had a ballot and we opted for the 25% pay rise. That didn't go down well. It didn't. The NUM were, weren't very happy. But when the strike was over, the NUM wanted to come back into our pension scheme. They opted out in 1962. Really? Yeah. And they wanted to come back in it. We said no chance. Yeah, it was uh, the good old bad old days, I call it. I see footage now, you know, on YouTube of men walking out the pit at Hatfield. Mm. 
walking across the pit yard in 1982 or something like that before the strike. And uh, it's like another world. Yeah. It's like another world. It'd be nice to be able to just go back to 1982, walk down pit lane, put my rags on, go down pit, and go to the unit that I worked on in 1982, as I am now. Mm. It'd be lovely. Why? Because we only remember the good bits. We never remember the bad bits. Mm. And there were a lot of bad bits about pit work. There were days when it was really hard work, really hard work. I've seen me come home with no skin on my hands. Mm. None at all. Jesus. They were the bad days when you were working in water. I worked on a unit called 70s and it was coming in all the time. And you know what I was talking about, the weight. Mm. The weight was coming on the supports. And these supports were blowing off all the time. You could hear it. Pssst, pssst. And by, day by day, they were getting lower and lower and lower. And the canopies were resting on the side ends of the face, which were as high as that stool. And we had to crawl under that. God. And we were in there, cutting through six by six girders with a hacksaw. Jesus. Yeah? Cutting through. It would take us a shift to get through a six inch by six oh, inch girder. God. <clears throat> just so that we could get through to the other side and we were all in there there were six men in there as the roof came in and it just kept coming no well, stop nothing protection for five minutes we were under this steel what? canopy and how strong was the steel well it was thick steel oh, right, fabricated okay. so steel you, you were witnessing a roof above your heads yeah. coming in it was just coming and coming and coming and coming and coming all the time and all it was was dust and we were all just scrunched up like this waiting for it to stop and eventually it did. And we looked at each other and we went, my good God, what are we doing here? Give us that axle. Really? Went back onto it. Yeah, conditions like that. Unbelievable conditions. But it was a way of life. The dust used to hurt when you breathed it in. God. When the machine was shearing through the fault, it was going through sandstone. And it had shear through and it was white dust. You couldn't see that far in front of you. And if you breathed in, it hurt. So what we used to do, we used to climb into this, into the gob. That was behind the face. We'd find a hole. And the fresh air used to come down the face and detour through there. Really? So we'd get in there to get out the dust. In the gob? In the gob. So you were in danger, really? Yeah. But we'd, we'd used to sit there and rather than gobble all that stuff, you know. There's one thing we haven't talked about. Mm -hmm. Have we got time? Mm -hmm. I was in the mines rescue for nine oh, years. Oh, yes. Ten years. And that was thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyable. So you were still working in the mine. Mm. And as a, as a, like, you were on permanent call out. Yes. As a part of the rescue team. Yeah. Okay. And so really? you've obviously been trained for that. Oh yeah, yeah, I did my training at the uh, down Wentworth Road in Doncaster. It's now a Tesco. Yeah. But that used to be the site of the Mines Rescue Station. It was there from the 1920s. And underneath there, there's tunnels. There was a coal face on the roof. Really? Way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, all the, all the workings it had in the coal mines were all under there. Good God. All under there. And when I walk past and I see the Tesco, I wonder whether the tunnels are still there. Yeah, yeah. Surely they filled them in. Must think about that about all the mines in the area. Well, all the mines in Doncaster now that are being closed, they're all flooded. Right. They're just flooded. They're underwater. They're just underwater. When they closed Hatfield Pit for two years, a few years ago, the water came halfway up the shaft. God. And the shaft is a thousand metres deep. And the chairs, the ropes are that thick. That's a, that, and there was one rope holding the chair. Yeah. And there used to be 60 men on that chair when it used to go up and down. That was at the bottom of the shaft in pieces. The rope had snapped and it had gone. A thousand metres. <laughs> and a friend of mine, Robbie Saunders, that was in the man's rescue with me, he was still at Atfield Pit then, under private enterprise. 
he went down in a bucket on a rope and they lowered him down to the water and he put the pumps in and they pumped the water out and it took days and days to, to, to get and when he got, eventually got down into the pit bottom the chair was all crumpled up in the bottom and the water was still in the tunnels really? there was 365 miles of roadways at Atfield Pit 365 miles yeah a lot of it closed and sealed off but in total the surveyors went back on the records and found that we've got th we had 365 miles of tunnels at Hatfield Pit alone so how many millions of miles is there in the country did you know Stephen Longley on the miners rescue Stephen Longley was it Dan Stephen Longley the quiet guy uh, uh, yeah might be. he was miners rescue was he how recent? Well, it's pretty much. He's your generation. Was he? Steve Longley, where did he live? Did he live on Wentworth Road? In Wheatley? Well, that was near where Mind Rescue was based, wasn't it? Where that Tesco it was, was at the bottom, across from the club, where Tesco is now. Mm. All tunnels underneath there, you know. There's about two miles of tunnels under there. There's a coal face, two ripping lips, and lots of other tunnels. And a big pot belly stove, we used to burn tyres on there. And we used to go in with the breathing apparatus on and thick with black acrid smoke. And we used to take the fire service in with us, training. We used to train them. My sister-in-law, she lives literally, do you know, across the road from Tesco? Yeah. Or whatever that is there. Opposite the, the, the yard thing. So I bet there's tunnels underneath their house. Probably. Probably. There used to be a pub across from the mines rescue station called the, was it the Crown? Big place it was. Because we used to come out after a practice at lunchtime and go over for a pint. <laughs> As you did. A couple of beers and all. So did you see lots of service in a sense, action? Quite a few fires. fires. I went on, um, I went to Loft House. Oh, right, yeah, yeah, God, that was big, wasn't it? I was at Loft House when that flooded. Jesus. Um, Don Box, the guy that got killed at Bentley on the paddy. Yeah. Remember me telling you about yeah. him? Good friend of mine. Yeah. He was the guy that turned around to the HMI and said, because the divers had been in, they couldn't get through. You know, because British yeah. Coal used to have their own divers out in the Lake District. They couldn't get through. And Don Box suggested to the HMI, he said, look. You can photograph them if you want. No. That's one if we test our sets underwater, which we did, we used to inflate the breathing bag, push it under, under in the tank of water and watch for the bubbles. And if there was no bubbles, it was a good set. If there was bubbles coming out, then we'd put new washers in and tighten it back up. So all the joints were all tested for leaks underwater. Mm -hmm. He said, if we can do that with a set, why can't we wear it underwater? And he went, well, I was going to do that. And Don says, I'll do it. We tied a rope round his waist and he went in. The water was in a swilly. A swilly is like a valley. This is a flooded mine, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So he didn't know. There was men down there. Yeah, there was four men missing. That's right. There was a straight roadway and then there was a swilly, which was like a dip. And then it came back up to normal level further like on. Like a about, trap, like a trap. Yeah, about 200 metres away. They call it a swilly. And it filled with water and they couldn't get through. They sent, like I say, they sent the divers in. Couldn't get the diet, it couldn't get through because it clogged the filters up on the oh sets <coughs> because of all the debris in the water. So, Don Box tied a rope round his waist, put his breathing apparatus up, nose clip, mouthpiece, helmet on. <laughs> he even put his helmet on. And he walked in. And he said, When I get to the other end, I'll pull on the rope and my mates can follow. And they were all kitted up ready. And he got through. Really? So that's how they got through the water in really? the beginning before they got the pumps in. And he did the first recce, him and his team from Bentley, did the first recce of the site. And he came back and he said, it's full, the tunnels are full of breed blocks and bricks. Right. And the HMI went, so where's that come from? There's no breed blocks and bricks in by on a call face. Found out shortly after the incident that a farmer no had been filling in a hole in his field that kept holding up 
with rubble out of his farmyard, breeze blocks and bricks. Right. And that was an old shaft that filled with water over the years. And the coal face was getting nearer and nearer to it, oh. unbeknown it was there. They didn't know it was there. Jeez. And afternoon shift, sorry, day shift, left the machine halfway down the face. Went on. Afternoon shift came on, started the machine up, cut down the face, went into the corner, oof, hit the water. And the power of that water blocked off the whole roadway with breeze blocks and bricks. And to get in, we had to tunnel in the side, up over the top. Did you go down? Yeah, to get in. And that's how we got in there. How long did that take? Oh, weeks. So you, weeks. you lost the men? Two men were... Me we, they got two out. Two were OK. Two still there. So you weren't actually on a mission to save lives because no. you knew what the situation was? Well, we were initially because... One of the guys that was in the Loft House Man's Rescue Team, his son was there. He was one of them that was missing. And he vowed, he said he would never go back down the pit if they didn't find his son. But he did go back down the pit. Found him? No. No, his son was still there. Jesus. We were at Flixborough when Flixborough went up. Mm -hmm. Big chemical works in Lincolnshire. It was blue. And... Um, in North Lincolnshire. We went to that, but we went to find bodies. Mm. The, in those days, there was no rescue service. There was only the fire service. So the firemen had been in, but they'd only got half an hour of oxygen on the back. We got two hours. Right. So they asked us to go in, and they gave us some little flags. You know, like the ones you buy at the seaside, putting on your sandcastles? Mm. They gave us some of those white ones, the police. Right. And they said, will you try and identify where the bodies might be? Did you not see them, because they're buried under rubble. But you'll see the signs, flies. So where we saw all the flies, we put a fly. Really? And then we came out. And then they recovered them later once the chemicals had been cleared. Because there was a lot of, a lot of chemicals leaking from that site for a long time. We were there in 72, I think, something like that. It was really on. Mm. Might have been 73. And then I went to a fire at Bentley, two fires at Bentley, one at Rosington, fought three fires there. They were big fires. That was during minor strike. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. During minor strike. Then I'd come home from fire, a 12 hour shift on nights. I'd get, get home, have my tea, go to the pub. And the good lads there, you know, one strike and what have you. And they'd look at me and they'd say, you've been down pit today, you haven't you? I said, how do you know? I said, you're the guys. I was used to get mascara on. You know, I was, you always knew what pit man, because it mascara. You know, you'd see them in pubs and clubs that were over. You knew straight away where a pit man you were talking to, because he'd got mascara on. And uh, I said, yeah, I have, yeah. Where you been? What have you been doing down pit man? I said, I've been at Bentley fighting a fire. Oh, let it bloody burn. That's what they used to say. Right. Let it burn. That, were, that was the attitude of most majority of the miners during its strike. It is strange that it was feeding and clothing them, and yet they wanted it to. Mm. I find that strange. I find that strange. Even as a workman, I wanted to be a gaffer. Really? I used to love to see a deputy walking out. Really? Yeah, he'd walk in and he was a special guy. He wore different clothes to rest. And he had different things on him, like his oil lamp and his stick and his he'd have a waistcoat. Deputy stick. He'd have a waistcoat on. You know, with his watch in his pocket with chain. What even in your era? Yeah. Yeah. They were special guys, you know, these guys were very knowledgeable men. They were yeah, they were the bee's knees. And I always wanted to be one. A lot of respect for him. I always remember uh, Tommy Chapel. He was at my rescue with was Tommy. <coughs> and he, um, he was a young deputy then. He'd only just become a deputy, I always remember. He died a few years ago, Tommy. Fit man all his life. In the mines rescue, he had to be the fittest of the fit. Mm. Yeah, and, fit yeah. 
and uh, we used to do the Harvard Pack. Have you ever done that? What's that? Oh, used to put they used to wear you, and then they'd they'd put they put your leather jacket on with pockets in it, and they'd put a third of your body weight in lead in this jacket. Oh my God! So you're stripped off to your underpants and your pit boots and a leather jacket with a third of your body weight in it. Jesus. And you'd, you'd have a stool, two foot tall, and a metronome. And they'd set the metronome off to tick, 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 tick. And you'd have to step up and down on that stool for five, no, seven minutes to the metronome. And when you finish, they lay you down on a bench, take your, your jacket off, and take your pulse. Really? And they write it down. Three minutes later, they take your pulse again. Write it down. Three minutes after that, Pulse again. So we've got three pulse readings over a period of five minutes. Add it together, divide it by three, and that gives you your fitness index. Really? The first time I did it, I only just scraped through. Really? I got 70, which was high. A man of my age at that time was 23, I think. I should have, it should have been well down. And then I found out later why it was so high because nobody told me I could use the handles that were on the wall no. to pull myself up. No. I'd done it on me, on my own back. Really? So the following year, I used the handles and I flew through, wow. no problem. And then after that, they did away with the Harvard pack. We had to go on the treadmill with no weight on you. They just wired you up with electrodes. You had the cables over your shoulder, wired up to the computer, and you just walked. And you kept going and 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 then they elevate it and you're going uphill and you just keep going at the same pace wow. to a metronome, of course. <laughs> it was like oh that. God. It was weird, but that's how we did it. And um, and they wire it up. And I always remember the first time I did it, nurse said to me, she says, relax your left leg a bit. I said, why? She says, because it's showing up on this thing. You're using too much of your left leg. I said, I can't because I fall off. Because they set them up on a, with spirit levels, don't they? Yeah. They've got to be dead level. Otherwise, you end up. And so they had to stop it. I wish I'd kept my mouth shut. Ah. They stopped it, leveled it up again, and then had to set off again. I always remember nurses saying to us, hey, you could do that forever, you couldn't. And I said, yeah. I could walk all day, non-stop, doing that at that pace. And I've got to admit, when I saw that piece of rock, I don't know whether that's going to be the actual no. piece or not, but that did look like the stone we used underground, really? you know. Yeah, really? yeah. Apart from, like, I'm talking to you about sandstone. Yeah. When we used to hit sandstone, which was very rare, usually on a fault, it was like that. It looked like that. Really? Yeah. But the normal shale levels above the cold were lead. Oh, were in, there were thin layers, thick layers, and you could split them and they were like billy tables. Wow. You know, when it falls out. Like when the coal separated from the shale, yeah. it was as flat as billy table and as shiny as, I was gonna say my shoes, but I've got suede on today, but mm. really shiny, yeah. And you'd find little pea mussels dotted about between the layers of coal, between where the coal meets the shale, that's where you've got the pea mussels. You mean uh, fossils? Little tiny fossils, pea mussels like that, brown ones. Really? Yeah, perfect little pea mussels. I used to have loads of them, I'd give them all away. I used to have kept them. <laughs> we used to go fossil hunt, hunting when the pit went on strike. Let's say there were a walkout. Men went on strike, me and my mates would say, come on, we'll go fossil hunting. So we'd go down into Barnsley Bed, which were like a different level, down a one in two drift. And we'd get to the bottom and then we'd find all fossils. Oh. Because that's where the fossils were. There were very few in Asia, very few. You get the odd pea mussel, that was about it. Loads of fool's gold. You get loads of empirites. Mm. But never in its crystal form. You never found it in crystal form. It was always in layers, thick layers. Mm. And I'd chip it out and take it home, give it to the kids. Yeah, you know, gold from that bit. Yeah. And the problem with fossils underground was you, you got them and they were beautiful. Because as, as the shale broke away from the coal, you got all the leaves, mm. all, all in coal. Wow. So if you went like that, you'd, you'd have all the leaves in, in pure coal. Gosh. Set against 
the mudstone, yeah? Yeah. And then you put it in a bag, take it home, but when the air got to it, oh, it would just nice. break up into, just crumble away to nothing, to nothing. We used to have trees underground. We had two trees that I know of. Trees? Yeah, two trees. In the, in the uh, side. Um, there was one tree down the JCM, which was a roadway at the back of the pit, where the paddies used to pick up. Um, and it was a trunk that came down like that, and then all the roots went out. Wow. Yeah. And then there was another one down the paddy road that stuck out of the roof. And it was about that thick. Jesus. Yeah. Stone tree? Yeah. And it's still there. Underwater. <laughs> we'll be underwater now. Got a big car sponge like that. And he'd say, right, wash me back. He'd chuck it at me. And I'd have to wash it back and it was covered in air. It was like a gorilla. It was completely covered and I couldn't know, I didn't know where I'd been. <laughs> it was the same colour, you know. And yeah, brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah, that's photograph. And I used to...